Hey guys, Harry here with Zero's Geckos, vlog number 13. A few updates to update you guys on the season before I jump into our topic. Currently I have about 86 or so eggs that I've retrieved. I've paired about 43 or so. Some of them haven't laid eggs yet, so um, they're not proven yet, but um, there are a few proven breeders that are taking their sweet time this season, maybe three or four proven breeders that did really well for me last season. They started cooling in September, and now we're already March, almost April, and they still haven't laid me fresh fertiles yet. So a little bit weird of a season, uh, which seems to be a bit of the case for several other breeders. We're just having a slower season for um, some of our proven females. Hopefully they start to lay again by next month. Um, May already, we're almost into summer, and so that's gonna be a bit rough, but we'll see what happens. But I've paired a good amount of females, more than double from last season, so hopefully the production is pretty good this year still. Um, with about 86 eggs currently, I hope to hit at least 300 by the end of the season. We'll see. If I can get more, that'd be great. There are a variety of projects that I want to work on so that I have animals to offer people late season to next season. I do want to collect a few more females so that I can ramp up for next season as well. A bunch of stuff that I want to pick up. There's still grow outs and hopefully they'll be ready to go at the beginning of next season, 2025. So I'm currently pairing that many females more than double what I did last season, knowing that I'm going to build out um, an extra room to have more space for the geckos, uh, more hatchling racks, more grow out racks, um, some breeder bins as well. That's kind of in the process currently, so I'm excited to see what comes of that. I've been inquiring about more hatchling racks already and getting pricing on different uh, racks and rack makers. The guy that did my racks that I have right now, Dragons and Serpents, uh, Pete, He's in Las Vegas. He's kind of on hold right now as he's going through some life stuff and he's not able to take any orders at the moment. So I'm just gonna have a few backup guys to see if they can uh, ship things over when the time is ready. Quick update on my auctions. My website, zerosgeckos.com, I have an auction every week. Uh, I've been slowing down on that a little bit. I'm gonna pick back up, but I've been slow on that because I put up this one charcoal Phantom male, 38 grams, ready to breed, started at $100 and it didn't sell. So I put it up on Morph Market and it went to 100, 105 or so. And um, I'm not sure if that's going to sell still. So I'm not mad, but I think I am a little bit discouraged. But the market dictates the prices and the demand for something like that is just not high. So people are looking for darker phantom males or darker phantom females this one was dark as a baby but kind of lightened out a little bit as it aged up to ready to breed and it's more of an olive green color so when it fires up it fires up dark but not as dark as some might like so i understand why it might not have sold easily and i give it a shot and that's okay i can probably sell it for 150 bucks at a show if uh, the buyer doesn't pick this one up on Morph Market. But that's just kind of the nature of auctions. Sometimes it's hit or miss. Sometimes you put things up and you're going to get low pricing on it. And a lot of things that we have in general, it's very common. This goes to show you, if you're a new breeder, that you can have some fairly nice stuff. You can buy stuff um, at a time and in a season when things are at a higher price and more valued and more desired and wanted and then give it a year later, a season later, things drop drastically. So it's a little bit tough to kind of chase kind of the trends. Just keep that in mind, knowing that if you pay 500 bucks for a certain animal, grow it out, you might not, might not even be able to sell it for 100 bucks. And that's just kind of how it is. Um, and this is why I understand uh, when people say they're gonna leave the hobby. Life events have dictated that they have to exit, but we know what it is, right? The geckos just aren't making money. If the geckos made money, it's unlikely that they would give that up. But the geckos don't make money all the time. It's not a steady business, right off the bat at least. It takes a long ramp up to build 
a certain business and a certain steady flow of income. I was talking to AJ earlier and we were just talking about business and and man, it's just hard to do business if you don't have the patience, you don't have the animals, you don't have the funnels. It's not an easy thing to get into. It's easy to get into as a hobby and just to enjoy and play a little bit and if you're okay losing some money here and there or making just a tiny bit of money, then there's no worries, right? Just enjoy the animals. But if you're trying to make a business out of the geckos and the animals, it takes significantly more work and thought to kind of build that business up. So my goal is to build this business up, my business to become a steady flow of income for myself, for my family. And in order for me to get there, I'm taking certain steps. But like I've said in the past, this is not a get rich quick type of scheme. It is work. It does take work and patience a lot of patience to kind of build out to where you want it to be. If it's just a side hustle and it's just a fun thing to do and you have um, a separate job that will kind of help sustain your lifestyle, then that's totally fine. You can enjoy yourself. But if you're relying on geckos for income, it's a completely different ball game. Nonetheless, I want to be real with you guys and just share with you kind of the struggles and the slow trudge of building out a business and building out kind of projects and working and trying different aspects of auction or online stuff to kind of gain traction. And I want you guys to be able to see kind of the struggle so that you guys will know that it's no easy thing. I feel like I've done as much as I can, at least at the moment, to kind of gear myself towards um, sales. And yet, uh, third season breeding, I still don't have a steady flow of income. I'm selling stuff and that's nice. I'm selling some decent stuff. I'm selling stuff regularly, but not completely routinely, if that makes sense. Maybe those two things are the same, but I wish I was able to sell things on a weekly basis so that I can have X amount of dollars per week uh, to kind of funnel in and save or reinvest into the business. But currently, it's kind of a slow, hit or miss type of thing. It's kind of $100 here, $200 here, uh, once in a while $500. Once in a while, you know, I sold a hybrid um, for a decent amount of money. And that went straight into um, the Gecko Bank. And all of that is currently being reinvested back into building out the Gecko Room so that I can ramp up and build more of a collection and build out more of the operations. But I'm definitely not earning money for myself. I haven't spent anything on myself yet. Third season in, I'm just everything just goes straight back to the business, straight back into the animals. And eventually I need to kind of hold back and not spend anymore and um, begin to save. But I'm taking the mindset that whatever I'm making, I'm reinvesting 100% into the business while I can. I have a okay amount of savings to sustain my family. My wife works as well and I plan things out in a way so that I can uh, not be completely financially burdened as I kind of go through the steps of building out the gecko business. But it is not easy. So if you're gearing up towards a full-time gecko business, just be ready, be prepared, have a good amount of savings from your previous job and expect that you won't gain a return um, for a couple years at least. Uh, could be even four or five years. I remember we interviewed Gekana Days, Kyle Salzman, and he said that him and Crystal, you know, they, they're, they're OGs as well. They knew AJ from way back when, when they all started um, a, over a decade ago. And uh, in his interview at, on the Gecko Pod, he said it wasn't until five years in until they broke even from their investments into the animals and started making some money. So I'm taking that mindset that I'm three years in now, four years in um, next season, and hopefully four years in, I'm going to be able to um, have a better return on stuff. But even then, I don't think I'll be able to break even yet. I think year five, I might be able to break even if I'm forecasting things correctly. But I don't imagine it's going to be very much this year or next year. But this is why I have these vlogs to keep you guys updated so that you guys can see kind of the struggles of what's going on and how things are progressing. Okay, I gotta go again, but I will be back and I'll continue on the topic of um, what do you love most about the hobby? 
a week ago or a week or two ago, I asked on my IG post, what do you love most about the hobby? Because I wanted things to be a little bit more positive for these vlogs. Since I'm more of a Debbie Downer, I'm more of the negative aspect side of things. I wanted, thing, I wanted things to be a little bit more positive. So I asked, what do you love most about the hobby? I got a good amount of replies and responses. So I'm going to share that with you guys once I get back. Okay, I'm back. I went to the gym, went to get dinner, ran some errands. Now it's later at night, but I wanted to get back and finish recording. Getting back to our topic. So on March 17th, so about a week and a half ago, I did this um, post where I said, thoughts for the next vlog, which is this vlog. Thoughts for the next vlog. What do you love most about this gecko hobby? And here are some responses. A good amount of you guys shared some. St Let me show you guys how many people said community or people. Meeting other gecko people. That's Kathy. AM Geckos John says the people I meet. Victor Exotic says community. Seaglass says the community. Being able to make long lasting friendships with so many people who love the same things as you. Rathgate Reptiles says the incredibly kind and supportive people in the community. Ralph at Crusty Spectrum gave a special reply. <laughs> he said you with some emojis. Justin says the people, the animals, the creative outlet to try and create whatever you can imagine. We'll talk about that in a sec. I just want to show you guys though how many people said the community, right? Um, Crazy Kill Grows says, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, how willing everyone is to share info and mistakes they've made. Yeah, you know, people just sharing tips and um, helping each other. Lake City Geckos, I love the little communities every breeder builds. Alexander says the people. Simon says the people. This weekend was fun, I, he's at Tinley and I got to hang out and talk geckos, hobby with friends. Sly says, honestly, the friendships I've made, the people I talk to on a daily basis, they are my gecko friends. Noel, two girls gecko, honestly, the amazing people I've met. And Alex Gecking Gecko says the people. So there are a good amount, a handful of people, uh, responses that just kind of reference the community, reference the people. And I think that's awesome. I think that's such a beautiful thing uh, because we need each other. Whether you're in different cliques or different camps, um, different friend groups, I think it's so important that we all have somebody. We all have each other. So when you're a new breeder and you don't really know anybody yet, it's important for you to kind of just make friends. That would probably be kind of my first priority. It's not just trying to figure out information and how to ch pick and choose animals, which is um, very important, but it's finding a group of friends that you can bounce ideas off of and talk to and say, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, my gecko prolapsed. Um, what do I do? You know, and just worrying and being nervous but being able to share those things with other people so i think it's so important to find uh, your friend group and your community that you can just talk to and commiserate with and also to celebrate with i can't tell you how many times almost every day you know whether i'm taking pictures of geckos i'm looking and scrolling through um, instagram and looking at geckos that i message aj <laughs> like i just sent I send uh, him so many things and we always just chat about things and um, it's been so good to be able to kind of express kind of my thoughts and my feelings and kind of my dreams for the future and he does the same to me. He sends me things and he talks about business and kind of how he's progressing and improving. He talks about him renovating his giant garage um, at his place and um, just moving all his animals from his house into the separate garage unit that's huge you know we I get to um, just see how he progresses with kind of his projects and likewise as I'm kind of building out kind of my uh, gecko room in the backyard you know I can share that with him and I can be like hey uh, what about these hatchling racks what are your thoughts on this and how should I kind of um, do that setup and then you know he'll share his ideas and so it's so important and helpful to kind of have those friendships but more than just one person you know try to have a handful of close breeder friends try to have dozens and dozens of acquaintances you know people that you're cool with you might not talk to every day but you can just check in once in a while and say hi you know go to shows meet new breeders pass out your stickers and your business cards 
follow up with people that you sell to at shows, connect with other uh, crested gecko breeders or people within the new cow range and uh, make those friendships and say, you know, introduce yourself and, you know, follow them. Hey, man, good to meet you. I'm a new breeder. I'm vending. And I noticed that you've been here for a while. Just wanted to say hi and introduce myself and connect with you and say I follow you and I like your stuff. And you can connect with them back online through DMs. You can connect with them when you see them again at shows. I feel like that is probably the best way to make connections is definitely in person. Now, not everyone can do that, right? Not everyone's going to fly to California um, to meet Anthony and Jess or or people aren't going to fly necessarily to Florida to meet David at Tiki's you know like people will do that this is why a lot of us will eventually go to Tinley at some point to kind of meet and interact with different people and I suggest everybody do that at least once or twice go to Florifauna go to um, Tinley uh, where it is a hub of people a lot of well-known breeders and um, you know just meet them and say hi and connect with them you know, you'll have dinner together. I think at every event that I've been to, whether it's Tinley, Florifauna, or any of the super shows in California, we've always gathered up with a bunch of breeders, well-known breeders and newer breeders alike, um, and we just hang out. We have pizza together or wherever we choose for dinner. We just hang out and uh, talk and um, get to know each other. You know, next time I'm at a show, you know, hit us up and ask where we're going to dinner and if it's okay for you guys to join and as long as you guys are okay with just being really spread out because a bunch of people usually go to them then um, yeah just come out and sit with other people sit with well-known people like it's just it's just all kind of a good time when we just sit down and eat together and afterwards we'll, we'll just hang out and uh, chat I've become good friends with several people that I've met in person so if you are lacking community and you want community don't just do it online. Yes, definitely do that. But more importantly, meet people at the shows. This will show other breeders that you're serious, that you're legit willing to pay for a $400, $600 ticket, plane ticket to rent a car and hotels, it's basically spending $1,000 on a trip to go meet people. That might be quite a bit of money. And I'm not saying every single person needs to do that for every single show, but pick and choose certain shows that you think will maximize your output in terms of meeting as many people as possible. And so I did that. In 2022, I went to Tinley, paid everything out of pocket to go see people. I had no animals to sell. I wasn't making any money whatsoever from geckos. But, you know, I wanted to um, hang out and meet AJ and a bunch of different people in person. I think that was the first time I met AJ in person, even though... We started the Gecko Pod uh, earlier that year. You know, we were already chatting all the time uh, for months. Tinley was the first time I met, I think, Brian Hu in person and AJ uh, in person. And that was such an important meetup for me because it really solidified our friendship um, from then on. You know, I met several other people at that Tinley as well. I met Robbie Reptiles. I met uh, Noah and Meredith. I met Tyler and Maddie. I met M, M Zodic. A bunch of them probably didn't know who I was at that time. I think they knew we had the gecko pod, but you know, they didn't really know me. I met Gabby, I met Chad, I met Brian Susan from Sundown Reptiles. I met David, Tiki's Geckos. I met Janine at Treehouse. I met uh, Chris at Crusty Works and Lindsay at Cool Calm Crested's. I met Armin at Rax Etc. Brianna at Yeti Gex. I met Kikanades, Kyle and Crystal I met Andrew and Sarah Gilpin from LAC Herps. I met Donna at Crimson Cresties. I met Will and Audra from Flawless. I met Brian Butler from Altitude Exotics. I met Michael Browning at MPB Cresties. I get I met I met Kenny at Cold Blooded Only. I met Megan at MP Cresties. I met the guys at Sacred Exotics. I met Tom Gecological. You see, I'm not name dropping just to name drop. I'm trying to show you guys the importance of certain shows that you guys should go to. Even though a lot of those people didn't know, know who I was back then, it made a connection and whether they remembered me or not at that time, I'm not sure. But the important thing is, is that I made some key connections and some key friendships there that kind of catapulted uh, my uh, circle of people that I can confide in and talk to. 
And by doing that, meeting people in person, you also get a feel for who's standoffish and who's cool to hang out and chat with and where you can feel comfortable with to DM and be like, hey man, it's so good meeting you. And then you start talking like normal. And uh, you also get a feel for certain people that uh, just put on a show and don't really want to talk to you, <laughs> you know, because maybe they want to big time you or whatever. And uh, those people, I consider them acquaintances. I wouldn't consider them close friends whatsoever. And, you know, I don't need them in my circles because if they're not going to give me the time of day, then that's okay. And I say that knowing that they can't do that for everybody. They don't know who's going to be a key player within the get-go hobby because people come and go and they've seen it all, right? A lot of these bigger breeders have seen people come and go like nothing. Um, they make a big stink, they make a big splash, and they um, hype things up, they hype themselves up, and then two seasons later, they're gone. So they've seen it all. In order to really show that you are legitimate, it just takes time and consistency. There's no shortcut to developing your community. This is true of anything. I'm not just talking about gecko people. You have a lot of friends at work because you spend so much time with them and they're consistent, right? They're there every day. You have lunch with them. You get to know who to stay away from, who you want to have in your circles. You go out even beyond work hours just to hang out because you become friends, right? That happens to so many of us. It's no different in the gecko community. I see going to certain shows, even though it might cost quite a bit to go fly out to shows, it is an investment. I would say that investing in community is just as important as investing as a high-end breeder because let's say you have the best stock and yeah you sh maybe you'll get a bit of following here and there because you have good social media and you're able to have good stock but if nobody knows who you are if you don't have any strong friendships or connections in the long run it's going to be tough so my encouragement to you is to invest in community don't stinge on community. Just like you want to have the best breeder stock, you want to have as good of a community as possible. So AJ and I, we've tried to kind of build out this community along with Brian Hu from Who's Geckos, you know, with uh, the Gecko Pod and uh, the Discord that, you know, comes in waves in terms of its activity. But we really wanted to build a place where people can just come and make friendships and connect and you guys can do that without us too. Um, and a lot of people do. You guys have a bunch of your group chats that we're not a part of. I no longer belong to any group chats whatsoever. I have my own, you know, Discord and a handful of um, group chats of uh, closer friends. And that's okay. It's a beautiful thing. It's a good thing to be able to have a good group of people that you can joke with and share gecko life with. Your community is going to make or break you. Your connections are going to make or break you. Now, are there outliers to that? Of course, you can be a solo a Lone Ranger type and still kill it, absolutely. But the chances and the probabilities are much lower. And you can see from these answers that a lot of people seem to have found good friendships and found a good community to belong in. So number one, the best thing about the hobby is the people the community. We can also say that it can be one of the most negative aspects of the hobby, but we're going to try to keep this more positive, And so we're not going to go down that road for this vlog. Paige at Stenger Geckos. I think I'm saying that right. Sorry if I'm not. Um, she says, projects. Seeing the start of it through the progression of years of work and dedication. Yeah, Paige uh, um, has been around for several years and she's seen kind of the development of her own animals and her own projects and so she has a leg up on a lot of us new breeders um, that have only seen maybe one or two seasons of our animals she's been able to kind of produce and breed some of her own grow outs and made animals from that and I think that's such a cool place to be once you're able to do that so we'll talk about projects and uh, insomnia geckos also says the animals and the creative outlet to try and create whatever you can imagine sour doll also says i love the animals the most uh crypto crusties ashley says the excitement of babies hatching seeing what your pairing created 
Beastie Baby says, brainstorming potential pairings. Mr. Budgie Lover, how alien they look and act. Kale Gecko says, the gecko is my favorite part. Growing up, Gecko says, honestly, just working with my geckos, interacting with them, they're just the sweetest. Hub City says, the hobby is never ending. Morph species and the constant evolution and growth. The Reptile Queen Ali Bookout says, seeing what everyone is making in their projects. So another big aspect of what people love is obviously not just the people, not just community, but the geckos. This is why we're in it. We're really in it first and foremost uh, because we, we love the geckos, right? Even before we knew people with the animals and um, cresteds, we fell in love with the geckos. And I agree with everybody here about kind of the excitement of the animals and the different things that pair together and just, be, and just being able to dream about what you can create. Uh, different morph combos, different trait combos, a variety of what pairings can bring you. So for example, I, my primary base project is the high white. I'm creating higher coverage, higher white patterning coverage um, to a higher degree of white. So less creamy, more white. And um, Gen 1 was so-so, Gen 2 is so-so. Um, maybe a couple holdbacks here and there. But man, once I hit an animal, that's going to be like very white and very covered with some nice patterning that that I'm going to eventually develop. I'm going to be so excited when I hit that consistently. Another good example that I often use is AJ and his frost lane, right? He has high white, high coverage animals and I feel like he's hit a lot of those goals. He's developed that line for several generations and he's now producing animals that are so high coverage and with a high level degree of white on them. So when I was at North Carolina in November and you know I saw some of AJ's animals uh, that were grown out from his frost line, the holdbacks that he had that were breeding, they were insane. I was like, this is really next level stuff. You know, to be able to see a collection of how he got there and how he built it was amazing. And I can't wait to have that for my own collection, to be able to develop that. What we have in this hobby is amazing. As new breeders, you're not going to realize that the passion to develop a singular project or two is going to take quite a while. It's gonna take several seasons. So as new breeders, you just have to experience and enjoy the process of collecting things that you think are going to be amazing and then they just turn out so-so, but you take those holdbacks, you outcross it and you breed it into other things. You collect different animals with similar traits, you pair those together, you make amazing things and you keep that cycle going for several generations and you're gonna to begin to make amazing stuff. And I think that is such a satisfying thing to do if you're able to do that. Again, Justin at Insomnia Gecko says, uh, the creative outlet to try and create whatever you can imagine. I love how everybody has the freedom to make whatever project they want. Now, as do breeders, you're, you're going to learn there are certain limitations to what you can make, at least for now. right? We can always kind of break those limitations through breeding different things and different projects and where there's... Um, um, evolution and genetic drift and how and how different things can pop out of some of your pairings but there is the freedom to kind of dream and spend several generations working on these projects They're like long-term goals in life so when new breeders kind of reach out to me and kind of share their project ideas with me and even in the moment I'm like I'm not sure that's possible but you can try to work on it and I love that actually I love then as new breeders, we can think, think of what we want to do and we can work towards it. Now, as we kind of go through a couple seasons, a few seasons, we're going to begin to see what works and what doesn't work. And then we begin to adjust. But in the beginning, all of us dream. All of us see certain people, certain projects that other people have, other breeders have. And we're like, wow, that is what I want to work on. If somebody has like eight different projects as new breeder, I know for facts you're going to have to cut a lot of those projects already um, you might try to make them work but what's going to end up happening is you're not going to buy top breeders for eight different projects 
unless you have a ton of money, you won't be able to do that. I feel like I've spent a good investment into this hobby already. And even then, it was primarily for high white stuff. I can't imagine how anyone can spend um, a huge amount of money on eight different projects. So if you ask me as a new breeder what I think of your projects and you list me out eight to ten projects, I'm like, you got to cut those. It's not going to happen. You can create either a bunch of variety of mid animals or you can work at two, maybe, maybe three projects max as a new breeder because you're going to want to funnel all your resources towards those things. But that is the beauty of the hobby is that you can do whatever you want. Um, you don't have to take any advice that I'm giving you. You don't have to take any advice that anybody else is giving you, but you'll learn one way or the other, either with your community of people or by yourself. If you're by yourself, you might see how much of a money sink some of these projects are. So I think it's pretty obvious when you know you ask about what is the favorite thing about the hobby. There are two main things, the people, the community, and the animals. I think that's great. Those are beautiful things. Crested Tegus says... Favorite thing about this hobby is hybrids with rolled eyes. That could be a troll answer. Could be sarcastic. I'm not sure. But um, to me, hybrids are cool. I prefer 50-50 hybrids that look very obvious. In order to keep hybrids, they should look obviously like hybrids. People might differ on that, but I want to keep hybrids hybrids. I want things to look obvious. If it's too close to a crested and but it is 50-50, that to me is pretty dangerous. You really have to keep those um, animals separate. So the fear in hybrids is that you know people are going to start pairing them into the normal population of regular chewies or regular cresteds, which kind of um, mixes uh, different blood in, in, into the population. And I agree that you should keep those things separate. So I do like hybrids, but hybrids should pair up with other hybrids or just do what some other people do and try to pair um, a, a Kahua with your Cresteds. And I would say that if you're a beginner breeder, don't try it. I have heard of incidences, first-hand accounts of um, how some Chewies can just tear up Cresteds if they're too aggressive. Well, I don't think that's the case for many people that have tried. I know for facts that has happened before. You can say that about anything though, right? You know, gargoyles, when you pair them together, they can kill each other. Leeches, they can kill each other. Uh, Kahua, they can kill each other, right? And sample size is small when it comes to hybrids. Some people have done them successfully and they have done a good job with them. Other people, it seems to be a lot more elusive to kind of um, get some fertiles out of hybrids. Recently, I know that David Atikis made a post on his Instagram showing a hybrid, and it was a beautiful hybrid. That one, I believe he actually got from AJ. But his post read, should we breed hybrids? You know, and you know, a lot of people like them. David has had some YouTube videos about hybrids in the past. And so he's done it already before. But I think it's interesting to kind of have that conversation about whether or not to breed hybrids and how to breed hybrids. It's still kind of a tricky thing. Many people have tried and have not been successful. Alliteration C says, seeing the behavior changes as you build trust with the animals. With cresteds for me personally, some geckos are just really crazy and spazzy. I have enough animals to kind of have a somewhat larger population si sample size to kind of um, figure that out. There are a handful of geckos that are just really crazy. It doesn't matter how much you try to handhold, how much you train. They're just like the spazziest animals ever. Um, you can improve a little bit, but um, I have one gecko that is just absolutely insane. Uh, there's no holding it. You look at it and it just like freaks out. Um, it lost its tail earlier on because it just freaks out out of nowhere. I didn't even do anything. And then, you know, when you try to open to kind of feed and clean, the thing will try to shoot out. And it's run across my floor several times. Um, <laughs> that thing, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that one. <laughs> but I do believe that with certain animals, actually with a lot of our reptiles, you can train them to be calm and you can hold them. I know Brian, who whose geckos... 
you know, has some tokes and he hand trained them for quite a while so that they are less bitey because tokes are known to bite. There are certain animals that are still instinctually animals and so uh, you can never fully 100% predict what an animal is going to do but you can definitely work with their behavior and um, you can see changes in some of their behaviors so that they'll trust you just like alliteration says. But I'm not an animal expert on that level in terms of animal psychology or animal training to that level. You know, I've had dogs uh, for the last couple decades, but uh, that's different than reptiles, right? Mammals are a little bit different, a little bit easier to train. But yes, I do think that there's some truth in kind of building trust, hand, uh, handling your animals um, regularly, but not too often because I've also heard that uh, handling them too often is not necessarily a good thing either, right? They're wild animals that need to kind of be on their own. But I do think you can build some of that trust. But a lot of this is new to me as well. I'm still learning the habits of geckos. I feel like I have a good handle on crested geckos. I feel very confident with crested geckos just because they're a little bit easier to handle and to kind of figure out and kind of see little different ticks. Um, there's not that many, right? Crested geckos are actually very simple. But yes, you can train some to be calmer. And um, I've done it myself. So what is your favorite thing about the hobby? And it is people and the animals. Those two things fused together make for a very powerful affinity group and a very powerful bond with um, other breeders and your animals. Like it just heightens it to another level. So I'm big on community and if I can emphasize as much as possible, I feel like I can't emphasize this enough, invest in the community. If you're serious about breeding and becoming a business and becoming a part of the community, then show it. Support other breeders, buy their stuff, talk with them, fly out to different shows to meet these people. Right? Some people may not have the means to, but if you're buying geckos, man, instead of buying uh, two extra geckos for the next quarter, take that money, take that thousand bucks and fly out to a show. Save that money, fly out to a show. I feel like that's just as important as buying animals the thing is don't just show up to a show and be too shy and not talk to anybody and this and this is going to be tough but for introverts i'm actually also a pretty big introvert you have to kind of put yourself out there you have to break that mold if you want to be a part of the community you kind of have to break out of that rhythm um, just for a little bit at least so that you can make those connections now, is it possible to make connections online and build a very strong community online without ever seeing anybody? Of course that's possible. But think of it like this. You know, if you love the community and you want to be a part of the community and you love the animals so much, how much are you willing to give for those things? Let's say you start dating somebody. You know, you'll drive very far to go see your girlfriend or your boyfriend. If you have a long distance dating relationship, you live in different states, I guarantee you, you guys are gonna take turns trying to fly or drive to each other's places regularly. If the gecko hobby and building a gecko business is actually serious to you, you're going to do those things. And again, you don't have to do those things. You can just take your time, slow roll it, and just enjoy the hobby, totally fine. Again, like I always say, that's like 90% of the hobby. But if you want to elevate, your presence, if you want to elevate your community and you want to elevate kind of your future business plans, you just have to invest in the community, figure out the best show to go to where you can maximize your time there and just spend time with people. For that weekend at that trip, don't be too shy. Just go meet people, go sit with people, go be awkward with people. We're all reptile people. We're all kind of weirdos anyways, right? So. <laughs> you're not alone we're all just kind of weird people and we just come together and we hang out and I think it's great I think it's such a beautiful thing to to just have fun together and get to know each other okay ramble vlog is possibly getting out of hand as I'm starting to be repetitive so I'll try to cut back some of the repetition and hopefully just keep it short and clean I don't know what short means anymore I think this will probably be like another 45 minute episode, but I'm recording at like 70, 80, almost 90 minutes now, and I'll have to cut a bunch of this stuff out. But I really appreciate you guys replying to 
the IG story and interacting with kind of the vlogs and commenting below. It's been really good connecting with you guys. Thank you guys so much for your support in that area. I'm happy to be here to kind of report kind of my progress or my lack of progress in sales or um, growing things out. And uh, you can just kind of get a first row seat of kind of my frustrations with sales or the build out process and my impatience with things, my frustrations, but also the joys of things, right? Uh, I wake up every day and I really enjoy this hobby. I A lot of times I'll just kind of look at my animals that I'm um, photographing or I'm pairing up and, you know, as I'm feeding and looking at all the grow outs and like, man, I, I really like geckos. I don't love them that much where I'll tattoo them on my body, but I just love the projects that I'm working on. I love the people uh, that I get to share them with and it's you guys. So I'm recording this on Wednesday night and tomorrow, Thursday night, I'm recording a morph chat with AJ and um, Anthony and Jess from Little Monsters. I believe we're going to be talking about cappuccinos. I'm going to release this vlog after that episode. So hopefully I'm right about the cappuccinos. We're still kind of talking about it, but I think we'll talk about cappuccinos because it's been requested and also because it's such a hot topic still. Cappuccinos and sables, exanthics, like you know, the morphs. Um, we're all morph chasing to some degree. And I'll, sh I'll talk about that in my next vlog about how so many new breeders are just building their base off of morphs, um, the pros and cons of that. I'll try to release this vlog maybe on the weekend or else early next week. So that'll give me a few days to kind of edit and cut things down. Uh, should I show you guys an animal before I go? Oh, my animals are crazy right now. It's the nighttime, so they're all kind of active and kind of on the hunt. But let me see. This one is, I think I've shown this one before, but I really like this one. This is a Felix Julia female that I got from AJ. There's amazing coverage on this one. It's a little bit more on the creamier side rather than white, but it's very drippy. Such high coverage on this animal. Great structure. I paired this girl to ghost and I got a visual lock on this one. So, um, but it's, she's taking her time breeding. But yeah, she is a beautiful animal. Her name is Owl. It's a weird name, but I ran out of names. I'm not very creative in that realm. So I started naming a bunch of my geckos, just different animals. But anyway, thankful for you guys. I'll try to get back on the auction uh, for my website. And I, yeah, I still need to put up availability. I'm bad at that. Partly because I want to save animals for shows. But yes, you can see me procrastinating on a lot of these things throughout the vlogs, throughout the weeks. But you can go to zerosgeckos.com, look at the feature tab, and... Uh, Hopefully there is a new gecko there every week for you guys to see and bid on. And you'll get animals that I produce for a pretty good price. If it's animals I put up that I grew out and don't use, then you will get those for much cheaper than what I bought them. The Charcoal Phantom, for example, I bought that as a baby, kinktail baby for 600 bucks. <laughs> that was maybe a year and a half ago. I grew it out and uh, now it's not as dark as it was as a baby. Um, but you know, even at a hundred bucks, it wouldn't sell. So just to warn you guys, new breeders that, you know, that's kind of the cycle of things. You can buy things for pricey and not be able to sell them for very much. That's the risk we run as breeders. And sometimes, you know, going back to the vlog episode about taking L's, sometimes we take L's, we take L's on a lot of animals, uh, just be prepared for that. But Yes, you can go on my website, go to the feature tab and look at any other further animals for auction and uh, feel free to bid on that. Thank you guys. Appreciate you all. Subscribe to the channel, like this episode if you found it helpful and you can always DM me or in the ch comments chat with me and um, whatever else you guys want to hear about, feel free to throw in the comments. Otherwise, I'll just share things as I go. But appreciate you all. Take care. I'll see you guys on the next one.